to show you is before we start, it's uh, something that Megaphone did in the coverage of the Lebanese revolution. Uh, it's a two minute video about the 40th night of the revolution, which was, uh, which was actually last week, I think, or a few days before that. And it's the night when supporters of the political establishment uh, attacked protesters on the, on the bridge where one of the protests are taking place. Uh, specifically the, the supporters of uh, Hezbollah and their allies, Amal in Lebanon. So, uh, just to put you in the mood, we'll start with this video. But there's no sound. that was built from the uh, steel from the tents that they had destroyed in a previous attack. So this was their fourth attack. <laughs> and uh, so some artists built a phoenix sculpture out of them. I want to show you another picture that became famous in the protests, which is this one, which is a female protester kicking an armed bodyguard in the, in the stomach, and it became, she became an icon in the revolution. And you can see to the left the actual uh, footage. The actual. Uh, this happened on the first night of the protest. Well, I was thinking about it. <laughs> All right. With this uh, cute introduction, uh, I want to tell you a bit more about the Lebanese revolution and the role that Megaphone has been playing in this revolution. Uh, I'm one of a team of 30 members in Megaphone, but we'll get to that. Uh, so what you just saw, the video you saw, I like it because it kind of sums up where we are now. There are uh, protesters who are in overwhelming numbers, unprecedented in Lebanese history. But against these protesters, there are also uh, establishment supporters. And they've been led to believe that protesters are funded by embassies, that this is a huge conspiracy targeting Lebanon, that wants its destruction. When actually all the protesters want is an end to years of oppression and an end to the economic crisis that we are living through. And uh, the army is in between, and the security forces are in the middle, but they're not really neutral forces in this, and uh, we can speak for hours about the role that they're playing as state agents. Um, and also, you saw the attacks on the tents, and this is, these, are, these attacks keep coming back, and they keep targeting the protesters, and this is not the first time. After this night happened, uh, the supporters of Hezbollah and Amal movement 
and the supporters of the Free Patriotic Movement, who are their uh, Christian allies, uh, targeted many other protest areas. They burned tents from north to south. They beat up protesters. They intimidated. They harassed pedestrians. We saw thousands of motorcycles on the streets. And at the core of it, behind all of this, is a, a battle of narratives. Half the country, I would say, I, I don't want to say half because I don't know the numbers, but a lot of people believe that this revolution is righteous, and we're asking for our right to live, our right for dignity, our right to freedom. And another part has been led to believe that, like I said, it's a conspiracy. And in this battle of narratives, the role of journalism becomes very important, because this is what's, this is what's building this narrative. And uh, unfortunately, mainstream media hasn't always been playing the role that it's supposed to play. And that's when independent media becomes more and more important. And this is where Megaphone's role comes in. Um, so before I start, I just want to say that I want to introduce myself a little bit, even though Tim did a great job. But uh, I'm a journalist working with Megaphone, which uh, we launched two years ago in 2017 in Lebanon. And, uh, oh, I can use this. And uh, so, Four months ago, I came to Berlin to participate in the, I was invited by RSF to participate in the RSF uh, scholarship program, and we learned a lot about digital security threats and how to protect ourselves against them. And it was one of the most beautiful experiences and enriching experiences of my life. And then I go back in September, and a month and a half later, the unexpected happens. Uh, the revolution starts. So, uh, Megaphone was started in 2017 by a group of young journalists, activists, uh, designers, political scientists, and researchers who did not feel in any way that the media landscape represented us. Uh, mainstream media in Lebanon, I mean, Lebanon is a democracy, and we have different TV channels, different newspapers, uh, different online platforms, but they're mostly, con uh, they're mostly controlled by political interests and by uh, business interests. So they're not always reliable, and I would say most of the time they're not reliable at all. Um, even though really good, reliable journalists work for them, and they have been doing great jobs, it's just uh, the editorial line of these, uh, of these stations and of these newspapers are often dictated by the politicians who own them. Um, and one thing that happened since the start of the revolution is that we saw a lot of journalists resigning from the outlets where they used to work, and big names, big journalists, they started submitting their resignations, stating that they were being suppressed by their own media outlets, that they could not uh, support the revolution the way they should, they could not speak their minds. So I think seven journalists in Lebanon uh, publicly uh, announced their resignation. Most of them were from the camps of uh, Hezbollah and their allies, and for outlets that worked for, these, uh, for their narratives. Um, so Megaphone was created to fill the gap that mainstream media was creating, to bring the news closer to audiences, specifically young audiences. And this is why we exist mostly on Facebook. If I can go back, you can see here how we tailor our content. Like, the thumbnails are very colorful. They're very, we try to make them catchy. We want people to read the news. We want them to know what's happening. And we try to make the news as accessible as we can for them. Uh, we were supposed to launch our website three days after the revolution started. But the night of the revolution, we had a meeting at like 2 a.m. and we were like, no way, we're launching it tonight. So it was a nice coincidence, but we launched our website the night of October 17. And it's a website on which we started publishing written content, which we weren't doing before. We were just doing videos and cards and images. Now we have uh, journalists from around Lebanon who submit writing for us, and they want to be published with us. Uh, and of course, we're happy to oblige. Um, and this was also part of our strategy to move away from social media because of the many uh, problems that I will be discussing. Um, I would say the most important thing about us is that we, we're independent. We are politically and financially independent from political groups in Lebanon. Uh, we refuse, I mean, we have donors, uh, mostly uh, organizations that fund uh, grassroots journalism, but we refuse to let that affect our editorial line. That's one of our main conditions. Uh, we are mostly volunteer-based in Lebanon. Uh, I was a volunteer until I came back from Berlin. Actually, I started getting paid a symbolic fee, and I'm just one of two people who get paid 
the other one is a creative director who quit her job to be able to work with us and come up with what you're seeing. Uh, her name is Jamal. And everyone else mostly is working uh, as volunteers. They have jobs, they finish their jobs, and they come to Megatron, they stay late. Uh, with the revolution, this, the jobs stopped, so a lot of people just started, sp started spending all their times in, uh, in Megatron, and this is why our outputs increased as well. You can see here some samples. We, we, we used to make a weekly roundup of news because of our uh, resources. We started making them daily since the revolution started. So we have like six of these cards published every day. And we publish uh, reactions from politicians. This is our president. This is something he said uh, a few days ago on December 2. Those who spread negative publicity about the Lebanese currency will be prosecuted according to the law. This is at a time when our currency is losing its value at a ridiculous rate. Uh, before I came here on, on the stage, like half an hour ago, I heard that four people committed suicide in Lebanon today because they couldn't afford to live anymore. Uh, this is not new, it's been happening, and it's really tragic, and this is the reaction of our president. If you say bad things about the currency, we're locking you up. Uh, that's not even the worst thing he's ever said. So, just let me make sure I didn't say anything. All right, then uh, let me go back to when the revolution started, which is on October 17. This, not this picture, I took this picture on October 17, uh, the night it started, a few hours after it started. Um, it was unexpected. Uh, at around 11 p.m. at night, tens of thousands of people across Lebanon uh, went to the streets and started rioting. They started burning everything, uh, breaking glass, public property, uh, uh, chanting slogans against the establishment. The main slogan was, everyone means everyone, because Lebanon has been divided, and uh, diff different uh, sect representatives have been, uh, since the war ended in the 90s, they've been controlling the country, and they keep arguing about their, the, their sharing of power, like Lebanon is a cake and they want to share it equally. And they've always, that's how they've controlled the people, according to their sect. So on this night, people were chanting, no more. Like, it's not you or you, it's all of you, we're done with you, you need to leave now because you've crippled the, con the country. And this comes after uh, months of economic collapse that was happening uh, slowly but steadily. Fuel shortages, uh, bread prices were threatening to rise. Hospitals were saying, we will, sh we will uh, in a short while, we will no longer be able to afford medicine and medical equipment. They were threatening to strike. Uh, and journalists who were covering the economic collapse were being locked up because they were accused of uh, causing panic. And an economy, this, this kind of accelerates it. But they weren't even doing that. Like One journalist once tweeted, I went to the bank. They said they had no dollars, so I couldn't take out my money. He gets a phone call, uh, he gets put in a, in a cell, he gets interrogated for hours, and they made him sign an agreement that he will no longer insult the Lebanese economy or something. And then uh, he was released, which is very intimidating for other journalists. Some lawyers even sued The Economist for talking about Lebanon. Uh, the Economist published an article as a main story about the, econo about the economy of Lebanon, and a bunch of lawyers decided that they want to sue them for tarnishing our image. Uh, and then, a few days before the revolution started, we had forest fires, because we had some hot weather. So, the forests in Lebanon just burst up in flames, which is the last thing anyone needed. And everyone was really feeling low already, things were really bad. And then we wake up and we see our forests burning. And this went on for three days, as we watched our country literally burning. Uh, people were devastated, it's all anyone could talk about. And when we were like, why, why, can't the, why can't the government put out the fires? Why has it been going on for three days? And of course this happens you know, in the world, but the thing in Lebanon is we didn't even have the planes to put out the fires. We were getting planes from Cyprus and from other countries, from Europe, because apparently our firefighting planes, which the government paid hundreds of millions of dollars for them, uh, weren't maintained. They were just in the airport taking a nap because we hadn't paid to maintain them. So everyone was like, where's the, where's the maintenance money going? You know, why, why didn't you maintain them? And the government didn't have an answer for that. And obviously corruption is the answer. And to make things worse, 
one of the ministers on that day, while everything was burning, he goes out and he says, uh, I don't want to sound sectarian, but the real question is, why are the fires only happening in Christian areas? So he was implicitly blaming Muslims for burning Christian forests. And that really made the people lose their minds. Like, what are you talking about? It's already bad that we can't hire, um, what do you call them, uh, forest uh, keepers? Like the people who are supposed to maintain the forest because we can't agree if they should be Muslim or Christian because this is how entrenched sectarianism is. So, uh, so he goes out and he says that and then someone else accused Syrian refugees of, the, of uh, lighting up the forests. So it was just like, it was reaching the big point. And then one day after the fire stopped, we wake up to the news that the government was going to impose a tax on WhatsApp calls. Uh, like a 30 cent or 40, I forget, but a few cents on uh, voice over IP calls. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, it built up on social media throughout the day, and then at night, thousands would hit the streets, and then they ambushed a convoy of a politician, and his bodyguard pulled out a gun and tried to shoot at protesters. I mean, in the air, not at protesters, but still, there was a gun. And this is when the woman kicked him. And People heard that someone raised a gun at protesters who were protesting for their right to live and for their money, and that brought tens of thousands of people all across the country. And it's been going on, I think today is the 50th day since that day. Um, and it's been great for us, honestly, because the, when the revolution started, mainstream media started slowly getting exposed. Like, you couldn't really trust what you were seeing on TV. You wanted to hear something, you needed to find the right channel. Like, who, who's protesting against whom? If they're protesting against, let's say, X leader, then you can't watch this station because they're probably not covering it. You need to go to the station of his opponent and you need to watch that station. Like, that's, that's really how it is. Like, you hear something, oh, who's covering it? Then you assess if you should believe it or not. Uh, so, people started, young people especially, started turning towards uh, alternative uh, media. And Megaphone has been there since 2017, under the, uh, under the radar, but doing steady work. So we were prepared. Um, and they all suddenly turned to us. And uh, the one time before that we had a spike was during our coverage of the Lebanese elections because we had similar circumstances, but nowhere near this big. And this the contrast isn't very good, but this spike that you see over there, that's October 17. That's, that's what we were before October 17, and everything after is October 17. On Instagram, the night of October 17, we had 8,000 followers. This was taken a few days ago. We're at 20,600 followers. So a rise in followers from 8,000 to 20,600. I don't know if it's the same in Germany, but in Lebanon, where we're a small population, this is like, this is celebrity status. Like, people want our autographs. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But, but honestly, it says a lot, and what's, what's been happening is uh, it's not just the reach and the numbers, it's also people and the messages we've been receiving from abroad. There are a lot of Lebanese expats abroad who, uh, who don't have access to news from Lebanon because of paywalls or because of, again, unreliable uh, media. So they would text us and they would be like, thank you for telling us what's happening. Please go live on Instagram. Please try to keep doing the news every day. And they even offered to donate or to help or to volunteers. It's been overwhelming support, honestly. And uh, other bloggers, for example, this is a famous blogger in Lebanon, Gino, he would take our videos, post them on his page, and he would say, like, follow Megaphone News right now, they're the ones you should be following. So this, this was also very encouraging to our team, who are mostly journalists, who started really wanting to give more. Um, of course, with all of, uh, sorry, I have one more thing to say here. And we went from producing basically two videos a month to more than three videos a day. Uh, we went from producing weekly news, uh, weekly news roundups to daily news roundups. We went from producing no written uh, articles to three or four written articles a day. And we came up with new formats. It was really a boot camp in journalism, I would say, because most of us aren't journalists. We, we had to learn this in Megaphone. These are some formats we came up with, which is where we take speeches from famous politicians. This is Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah. This is Gibran Basile, the son-in-law of our president and our unofficial president, I would say. Uh, and he's our foreign minister too, we keep forgetting that. And this is the prime minister, Saad Hariri, who resigned on the 13th day of protests. So we would take their speeches, and this is something that was never done in Lebanon, honestly. Uh, people just take the speech and they, they print it or they plaster it somewhere. 
we took the speeches and we dissected them. We tried to say what wasn't being said. We tried to read between the lines. And this gave us a lot of, this was a playground to say what, what, what they were really saying, you know. Uh, like Saad Hari would say, I will give you reforms in 72 hours. And then we would be able to say, like, no one asked you for reforms. We're asking you to leave. That. So this was our format to be able to do that. Uh, obviously, we got accused. They were like, you're manipulating speeches, uh, you're, you're, chain, you're twisting their words, that's not what they're saying. But of course, we were not doing any of that. We were just saying what they're really saying. Uh, it was speech analysis. And sorry, before we get to that. Uh, and, you know, these, these were mostly what brought us a lot of support and a lot of followers because people wanted to know our take and they wanted to hear more about this. And with all of this, uh, you know, fame, I would say, or influence, the threat came. And this is something that uh, maybe I should have quoted him, John. He's the director of Megaphone. He's my friend and he's one of the founders of Megaphone. And he said this sentence and it really struck me because it's true. And I think it summarizes a lot of the problems of social media today. What was a subversive tool in the Arab Spring in 2011 no longer is today, even though, of course, we rely on it and we exist because of it. But the governments have learned. It's been years and they've learned. And they've learned how to use the tools that the people once used. And they're using them against us. Uh, and what was interesting in Marie's presentation is how Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro goes on his live stream, you know, or how Trump takes to Twitter. Or in Lebanon, for example, how they, they've created these pages and how they, they disseminate fake news. So, yeah, it's no longer the, the haven it once was. It's just another platform. And we don't owe them any thank yous for, for letting us use their platforms. You know, they owe us thank yous. Uh, this is how we feel, at least. Um, which brings me to the threats on social media. This is an article that was published by a really good uh, journalist called uh, Timur al -Tarif. Full disclosure, he lives with me and we're friends. But he's one of the journalists who has been doing an amazing job in covering the revolution. Uh, he published this article, Instagram briefly censors criticism of Hezbollah, which I'll talk about later. This happened with us in Megaphone. And go figure, he was the only journalist who accepted to cover this. Uh, or was not accepted, just who felt it was a priority to cover this. Um, the problem with social media, I would say, is that it's a black box for us. We, we know its policies, but we don't know how, it's, how they're enforced. We don't know how it operates. We don't know why Facebook enforces these policies sometimes, why it doesn't. How can we bring back a video that was taken down? Who can we talk to? We don't know. It's just this box called Facebook or Instagram, and we deal with it, and we just accept whatever it gives us. And whenever it takes something from us, the best we can do is like, oh, okay, well, Facebook doesn't want us to speak about that or to talk about that, or it just rejected our uh, request to advertise this topic. Um, and this is what I want to talk more about. Um, for the first problem is confusing criticism for support and censoring political content. Uh, I put these translations here. These are thumbnails for our content. This is called Break Down a Speech, Break Down a Government. And this is an article by a famous journalist who joined our team uh, a few months back. Uh, the article says, Nasrallah, two points, I am the government. Because this is what he was basically essentially saying in his speech. He was saying, I am the government, and the government will not fall. He didn't use those words, but this is an opinion piece. Uh, and clearly, this isn't support. We're criticizing. You know, when I say Nasrallah two points, I am the government, we're not saying, oh, you should be the government. We're criticizing. But I don't know if it's the algorithms or the moderators, but Facebook thought that we were supporting Hezbollah. And Facebook has this policy that uh, in an effort to prevent and disrupt real world harm, we do not allow organizations that proclaim violent mission or terrorist organizations to uh, publish content or to receive any form of praise or support. Uh, and of course, uh, the United States and many countries in the EU uh, have labeled Hezbollah, at least Hezbollah's military wing, as a terrorist organization. So Facebook adopts this label and prevents any posts about Hezbollah, which, if you ask me, is absurd uh, because. It's not a luxury like, to not talk about Hezbollah. We need to talk about them. They're one of the major political players in Lebanon. Uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, is arguably one of the most powerful people in Lebanon and the Middle East. He's more powerful than our president and prime minister combined. And you tell journalists they can't 
mention Hezbollah because Facebook might think they're supporting them. Um, I mean, you could even argue that even if they were supporting them, aren't you kind of stifling the debate? But I don't want to go into that. But I don't think censorship is the, is, is the way to go here. This might work in other countries, but in countries where they're major players, there needs to be other solutions. Uh, so anyway, they took down our post, Instagram, not Facebook. Facebook left the post, which once again, um, double standards, why is it on Facebook but not on Instagram? This wasn't clear to us and we still don't know the answer. The black box, like I said. Uh, so we posted it again and it got removed again and then we posted it a third time and then it got removed a third time. This happened over the span of 48 hours and the third time Instagram tells us your account may be deleted. Imagine, like, we're spending nights, we leave work, we leave work at 4 a.m. and all our work is on Instagram and Facebook and we, we face threats from the inside. We're getting, like, trolled, we're getting harassed, other journalists are getting locked up. Well, not yet, but activists are getting locked up. And then Instagram comes and tells us, hey, you know what, if you talk about Hezbollah again, we're removing your videos. So we're like, what? <laughs> uh, this is a quote from Azza. This wasn't the article I showed you before. Uh, and I really agree with what she's saying, because one of the most important things about the revolution is that it broke the taboos on the streets. For the first time, people were not afraid to criticize or even insult their, uh, the leaders of this establishment. But then the censorship was coming from a platform because of a mistake in the algorithm or because of biased moderators, I don't know. Another problem is that there's no direct communication with these platforms. Uh, this is an email that was sent after the videos were taken down. Uh, I put it there just to show you how we deal with these things. Most of the time, we don't have press syndicates that are reliable in Lebanon. We don't have lobby groups. We don't have media organizations. We don't have anyone to speak on our behalf. Most of the time when this happens, uh, we, we can just scream at the laptop, like this is what's happening. Then we run around like headless chickens. Oh, I know someone who knows someone who once spoke to someone who works for Facebook Dubai. Okay, I'm gonna call that person. For me, I'm lucky because I know RSF, really, and I keep bothering them on Sundays and at evenings. Uh, I, spy, I call them in and they play, yeah, yeah, and I'm sure you speak to Daniel too. And it's really like, hey, I'm sorry, they took down our post again, or hey, I'm sorry, they're doxing my friend. And then they have to speak to Facebook, and then we don't know how the reply happens. And by then, you know, things would have gotten really ugly. And it's not just that they would have gotten ugly, it's also that, for example, take the Hezbollah post. This was a reaction to a speech that he made. And in a revolution, things happen every few hours. If you bring me back my video, by the way, I forgot to tell you, they did bring back the video. This was resolved. Like, uh, two days later, the video was put back, and they were like, okay, we're sorry, we verified you, we can keep the video. But this was too late because we're shaping public opinion here. We want people to know what's happening. We don't want them to just believe what mainstream media is telling them, like, oh, yeah, you should believe this speech and he's being honest. So by the time the video came back, it was worthless. And Facebook didn't tell us why it removed it, so we can't avoid it for the second time. It didn't tell us, uh, it didn't tell us why it got removed on Instagram but not on Facebook. Uh, and it made no compensation in any way for all the human resources that were wasted trying to bring back the video or for the time that was wasted and even things that can't be you know compensated uh, so yeah like I said whoa, whoa, whoa. like I said it's always like fighting windmills when it comes to these things which brings me all of these are basically related but slow response to urgent threats taking down a video is a bad but it's not an urgent threat all right, no video, fine. Uh, I'm sorry about this picture, but this is, this is a Hezbollah slash Amman supporter, I don't know. And uh, he's doing this to our photographer called Lejain Jo, who's been on the streets in very dire conditions. Uh, and I used it to show just, this is a small image of how aggressive they are with journalists who are covering the protests. At least he's not beating her up here. Uh, and. In times of conflict, online threats can very easily become physical threats. And we've seen this happen many times. And if we don't have a line of communication, if these platforms are slow to respond, there could be very big damages, including like lives could be destroyed, if not you know, ended, but hasn't gotten there yet. Uh, but one thing I want to talk about is our friend and colleague. Uh, I don't want to say her name. I didn't put any pictures about that for her safety. But basically, she was photographed in a protest 
with a megaphone chanting, uh, chanting, leave, leave, Nasrallah, which is a chant that some people dare to sing. Uh, and a journalist who is supportive of uh, the establishment basically tweeted that video with her name. So his followers retweeted that video with her name, her phone number, and her address. And something very similar to what happened with Marie happened with her, where she started getting harassed. They started calling her family. They started calling her sister. Uh, they started asking about her in protest. She would see men walking around like, do you know where she is? And they knew which university she goes to. They knew everything about her, not to mention the reputation. Uh, luckily, she was studying abroad, so she went back to where she was studying, and she's safe now. But uh, I don't even have no, her number anymore. Like, she changed her number, and she didn't give it out to anyone. Uh, and worse than that, when that happened, we were all in the... I can speak for a megaphone, but I was thinking, I don't want this to happen to me. So automatically, subconsciously, there's this topic that suddenly becomes off limits. You know, you're not supposed to talk about that because they could destroy you. And I mean, it's fine if we don't say, yeah, you know what, I'm fine with my life being destroyed sometimes because it's, it's, it, it could get really dangerous. Um, another threat, uh, this is a famous journalist in Lebanon, her name is Dima Sadiq. She's a TV anchor, she used to work with NBC, she quit a few days ago, uh, also due to political reasons. And uh, this was taken moments after her phone was stolen at the protest that I just showed you. So Dima is, has been the victim of months, if not a whole year, of uh, a campaign of hate and abuse on uh, social media. The Twitter, the, the, the hashtag, uh, low life Dima has been trending in Lebanon for like I think several months even before the revolution to the point where we, we ignore it now like oh there's there's this abusive trending hashtag towards Dima. Uh, Dima is a journalist who is very famous, uh, very outspoken. She comes from the south so she comes from Hezbollah's environment but she's anti Hezbollah and that kind of like enrages them I think. Uh, first of all because she's a woman, second of all because she's Shia, third of all because she's a journalist. So really, oppression meets sexism in the nastiest of ways. And the kind of things that she's, she's been subjected to, they would call her mother. They had photoshopped pictures of her mother onto pornographic material and sent them to her. And her mother is a very conservative woman. And uh, she once tweeted, like a week before that, she tweeted, my mother just had a stroke and she's in the hospital and she blamed protesters, not protesters, I mean, the, see, even I'm believing the conspiracy. <laughs> she blamed the, the establishment for like harassing her and she's like, leave us alone, please. Uh, a few days later, she was taking a picture of the protest, and someone runs from behind her and snatches her phone and runs away. And uh, that's horrible, but what's interesting is that she started screaming that she doesn't have a lock on her phone, which goes to show, like, this is a journalist in Lebanon, and not, this is not her fault in any way, but there's a really lack of awareness about the security measures to be taken. I mean, a phone without a lock, the phone of one of the most controversial and biggest journalists in Lebanon, apparently wasn't properly secured. And they stole it, and she said she wiped the information from it, but I don't think it matters at this point, because they can just make up anything and say, oh, we found this on her phone. So that's going to happen regardless, but still, there's a big need for proper digital security on these things, and this is something... Uh, there were four other phone attempts for journalists. This is the only one that worked. But other famous journalists reported uh, protesters in the midst of an attack tried to snatch their phones, and targeting them specifically. Um, Throws and, electronics, throws and electronic armies. Um, this is another uh, thing that we've been observing. It's not new, of course, uh, but we've been recently getting more and more of these. From the hashtags on Twitter, uh, there was, there was a, at the beginning of the protest, there was also a hashtag that said Nasrallah leave, and it was trending. And then a few hours later, it became uh, something like, we support you, Nasrallah. And most of the tweets that had used the hashtags were from users that were created in the past few weeks, or uh, sorry, in the past few days. So there is a clear uh, online activism happening on their part to kind of subvert any online action. Uh, on our page, on on, uh, on Facebook, for example, every time we publish an article that touches on the establishment, for example, this said, there's no point to another May 7. May 7 is a reference to May 7, 2008, which is when Hezbollah uh, basically used their weapons internally. They there were snipers in Beirut because someone tried to dismantle their uh, telecom system. They have their own telecom network. 
So this is a very dark day in Lebanon. People talk about May 7, uh, like it's a really bad thing, you know, like Hezbollah using weapons against the people of Lebanon, uh, which of course they have a very different, actually they don't have a different narrative, they just say if you touch us, that's what happens. That's what happens. Um, and so we wrote an article that says there's no point in repeating May 7. And we got comments on this that were like, you guys are creating strife, you guys are Zionist agents, you guys are working for embassies. Uh, so this, this one I highlighted that everyone report this page in this post. Another comment like that was everyone report this page, uh, let's take down this, let's take down this uh, strife causing page. Uh, so you can see how quickly they organize and how quickly they find themselves. They're not all you know, bots, of course not, they're users. But they have a network of communication and they can ambush a page and put it down uh, very quickly if they wanted to. So there's no solution to that either. And I think one of the things that these social media companies don't really understand, or maybe they do, but they don't know how to fix it, is that the world is in Silicon Valley. You know, uh, hundreds of people reporting a post in California means one thing. Thousands of people reporting a post in Beirut means something completely different. It doesn't mean, oh, the post is bad. It could mean the post is just attacking someone they don't want attacked. Uh, and also, they, the application of politics really differs. For example, in the United States, Islamophobia is a huge deal because Muslims are a minority, of course, and Islamophobia is a huge deal everywhere. No one's saying no. But when we criticize a religious cleric who owns an army in Lebanon, that's not Islamophobic. That's politics. So you can't say, oh, you can't criticize him, or you can't use his picture on a post because he's a religious man. That means something completely different in Lebanon than it does in the United States. And also, obviously, there's a clear double standard here because um, I really think there's a bias with moderators because one time there was this video of uh, two men kissing in a pool, and everyone was reporting it because the men were filmed without their consent, and it was posted on a page that was calling to kill the men. And I'm one of the people who reported this video because it was endangering a man. And Facebook goes like, oh, it doesn't violate our community guidelines. And I think Facebook just thought, like, I was being homophobic. Like, that's not why I'm reporting the video. I'm reporting the video because you could kill someone, because these people don't want to be out, and you're outing them, and you're calling for their death. And the video stayed on Facebook. Uh, meanwhile, a video gets reported for uh, criticizing a religious cleric, Christian or Muslim, and it gets taken down because we violated some hate rule on Facebook. Um, I think you got the picture on this. Uh, exclusionary algorithms. Uh, I don't want to say racist algorithms because I don't, I don't want to say, like, maybe it's not that, but they're definitely exclusionary. Uh, this picture isn't very related, but I like it. They put furniture on the streets to block the road. Uh, and they're excluding people, so I thought that would work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but basically what happens is, first of all, let me tell you, it's a nightmare to use Arabic on social media. Like, especially if it's mixed with English, you get bugs, you get glitches, it gets, it, it, it like collapses. I don't know what happens to it. Uh, tr automatic translation from Arabic to English is a joke. Uh, one time we were talking about the arrest of an activist whose name is uh, Ali Basal, and he was arrested, and Basal in Arabic means onion, so Instagram decided to automatically translate the name to onion, and some people took screenshots and they were like, why are you mocking someone who just got arrested? And we were like, we're not mocking him, we didn't ask Instagram to translate, it just did. So these are small things, but they show how little these things are prioritized in these social media companies. Uh, another thing is the, the rules that they set for uh, monetization or for uh, unlocking features. For example, on Instagram, you need 10,000 followers to get the ability to link to your uh, <laughs> When, when you swipe up, you can get like a link. So you need 10,000 followers to do that. But 10,000 followers in Lebanon isn't the same as 10,000 followers in, you know, like maybe Germany or in the United States or in Russia. Like these are very different populations. So they're not, they're not really not tailoring their schemes. Also, the same thing for monetization on videos. Like you need a million views to be able to make two dollars. Yeah, okay, but a million views in X country is not the same as a million views in Y country. So. You know, these things are not tailored and they're not addressed properly. I don't claim to have a solution to this, but it really needs a solution. <laughs> because it, it's like really destructive. It's one of the worst things that has come out of social media. Uh, on the left, there's a video of a far-right Christian party chanting against Hezbollah. 
This video started circulating on Instagram, uh, sorry, on WhatsApp, on the night where Hezbollah was attacking areas. And someone released this video to show that the far right were insulting Hezbollah, and this kind of started provoking Hezbollah even more. And obviously, whoever released this video really intended to provoke, but this video wasn't from the protests. It was from years before in a very different context. And it just kind of resurfaced, you know, during the protests. And it's one of many, many, many. We would get videos of people insulting someone. And this video would be taken from like 2009, but they would publish it in 2019. And on that specific night, this video could have led to murder, like in the wrong hands. Uh, also, a lot of fake news were fabricated. Oh, X got murdered. Uh, this, this happened. Uh, the, on the right, you see a post, that, a picture that was posted from Dima's phone, the, the journalist whose phone got stolen. Uh, I, I blurred it, it wasn't blurred. It's a picture of her with uh, Israeli ex-Prime Minister Eddie Cohen. Of course, that's not true. She's taking a picture with one of the journalists who work with Megaphone right now. He's a very famous journalist. Uh, and we, we had a good laugh about it in, uh, in Megaphone, but it circulated as they, they thought he was an Israeli ex-Prime Minister, basically. And, and the narrative just like kind of took a life of its own. It doesn't matter if you say no. You know, we know this guy. He's right here. Uh, it's very easily falsifiable, as are most fake news, but it didn't matter by then. Uh, and like I said, policy is not tailored. Very high advertising costs. I think if social media wants to really be a tool for democracy and free speech in the Middle East, it needs to, it needs to really make it clear about its intentions, because these things sound beautiful, but they're not... They're not applied properly. Uh, we are a non-profit. We are volunteers. We rely on grants to produce content. And we pay a ridiculous amount to advertise on Facebook because we're competing against media giants to advertise our content. So we're, we're literally like competing with Vox and Vice. Right? <laughs> Vox and Vice and like, uh, you know, even state media or, or uh, uh, media that's funded by Iran or by Russia or by the states. So. It, it, it becomes really difficult to compete with them. And we really need tailored policies that take into account that we are non-profits, that we, we're not rolling in millions, and we refuse to take money to do journalism. So, you know, if Facebook is honest. I'm, I'm saying Facebook, but it's not just Facebook. It's also Twitter and Google and all of these other platforms. Uh, what we need, basically, that's, that's a short list. I'm not going to go over it because I already did. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, okay, that, that's it. I'm going to stop there. This is a nice graffiti that was made. I like, I like it. So I took the opportunity to put some nice pictures from the protests. Uh, thank you very much. And if you want, I can take your questions now. Thank you very much, John, for your very impressive presentation. Um, a step back from Lebanon, maybe. I know you are in alliance with the Egyptian um, uh, news online uh, magazine called Mother Massa, which was raided 10, year, 10 days ago by the Egyptian, I think, secret police or plainclothes policemen. Um, could you maybe elaborate how you're linked uh, or if you're linked and how this makes you, yeah. makes you feel? Uh, of course, they're good friends of ours, uh, first of all. And also, we're together in something called the February Meetup, which is an alliance. Uh, I don't know if you can use the word alliance, but it's a, it's a collaboration between different alternative uh, independent media around the Middle East. So there's Madamasser, there are also outlets from uh, Syria, from Jordan, from um, like different, different places. And uh, it's basically a way for us to keep in touch, to share knowledge, to share information, and to share support. For example, when they were raided, they were raided because of an article they published about the Sisi's son, I think, being involved in, uh, in Russia. I'm not sure about the details. Sorry, we, we were so caught up with the Lebanese revolution, sometimes it's hard to keep up with what's happening elsewhere. But they published this article, and then they got raided, and then they got, uh, a few of their journalists got locked up, and we know the journalists who got locked up. So the first thing we did was we published the article that got censored on Megaphone. We published it and we said this got, just got censored in Egypt and we're publishing it here. And we gave it reach and it wasn't just us. So everybody in the meetup republished the article. Uh, and then uh, I called RSF about this and thank you guys, like you got, because well, you got in touch also to try to help. 
and uh, it's a way really of knowing that you're not alone, you know, if your country decides to one day get rid of you, there are other people who will find out and who will help. Uh, and this story really shook us in Megaphone, because what was happening to us is one of our, it's one of our worst fears, you know. Of course, the situation in Egypt is far worse than it is in Lebanon in terms of these things, which is another thing I wanted to say, like, as bad as things are in Lebanon, things in the Arab world are like, horrible in other places, and uh, as bad as they are, we're still luckier than most. There's hundreds are dying in Baghdad, you know. Uh, there's an internet blackout in Iran. We don't even know what's happening there. Uh, but, of course, hundreds are dying too. Uh, content about Palestine most likely gets suppressed by social media. Uh, it's very... I, I can't back up this claim with numbers, but I've heard a lot of stories about how, you know, this content doesn't take the reach it wants because of other lobbies. Uh, Syria is Syria, so I think an alliance is needed between, you know, journalists, especially in these areas, to help protect each other. Okay. Um, is, are there any questions from the audience? Um, Um, I would like to add also, uh, there was a sudden, um, shocking sudden visit of Netanyahu to Oman, and uh, on my uh, Oman Association for Human Rights website, we vote rejection for this um, visit, and they should respect human rights in, uh, for the Palestinian people, and it was removed by Facebook and Instagram. Um, going back to the Lebanese um, uh, protests, uh, I would like to tell you that when it started in, in the Gulf countries, we were receiving clips, video clips uh, on the WhatsApp of these uh, pretty uh, Lebanese girls uh, talking in a very sexy way, saying, oh, come join a protest. They were just showing the silly, silly images, like uh, there are no serious um, issues that the Lebanese are protesting for. Uh, now, my question is, uh, the second phase of what is called the Arab Spring, which started in, in, in Sudan, and then it moved to uh, or Algeria and other Arab countries. Uh, uh, in your point of view, uh, do you think that Sudanese um, protest uh, is successful? And why uh, is taking longer in Algeria and other countries? Um. I'm ashamed to say I don't know enough about the Sudanese protests to answer this question. Uh, what I do know is that, you know, although it's, it could be tempting to lump these as like Arab Spring, you know, the different countries have very different contexts and histories and relationships with their governments. Uh, I don't know if it's successful, honestly. I don't know enough. I mean, I can answer this question about Lebanon, but um, it's my personal opinion that the fact that the revolution is happening, that's in itself a success, you know. Uh, and there's, there's kind of like a thread in common to be said about all the protests that are taking place, which is um, with, the, with the advent, I mean, something is to be said about social media and how it's spread has kind of created a new value system for people or brought to the surface this new value system that rejects oppression uh, and does not accept the same standards that older generation used to accept. Like the standards of living have changed and I think that's, affecting people across the Arab world and across the entire world, you know, it's not just Sudan and Algeria and Iraq and Lebanon and Iran, it's also like Chile and, uh, and Hong Kong maybe and, and uh, like all the other countries that are facing kind of the same uh, uprisals that we're going through. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, please. Hi John, Hi. congrats for your presentation. I think you're, you've raised a very important topic. It's about the, the superpower of the digital platforms to control the free flow of information online. And I think that then in countries like ours, where I'm from Brazil, so you know the story from Brazil about what Maria presented this morning. Um, I know that besides, so besides the authoritarian, the authoritarianism of our governments, we still have to face this kind of power from these digital platforms regarding censorship online. And we have in many cases in Brazil, uh, like you said, about content uh, removal without any kind of uh, logic. Yeah, they just apply the, their community standards and then remove it. And in 
they make no difference between what is being published by alternative media or by media channels and you know, or media profiles in this uh, in these platforms. And we are in Latin America now developing a, a proposition made by di different civil society organizations that work with freedom of expression and freedom of the press about uh, content regulation by the platforms. Because there has to be some kind of limit on the on their power to regulate content online. So I would like to know if you have any kind of experience like this in the Middle East, or, or if you're planning, or at least discussing this with other alternative media in the region. Because I think that, that this is something that we, we, at least from the Global South perspective, <laughs> we need to work on. I mean, of course it's needed. Uh, I don't know if it's happening, uh, if there is any initiative to uh, kind of limit the power of uh, social media outlets in, Monitoring posts and have have a more have a system of uh, transparency that's clear about which posts get removed and how. Um, I don't think that's I mean not that I know of, but I mean in Lebanon it's very specific because Lebanon first of all is a very small market. You know it's a small country with a small population, so we very frequently get disregarded. You know oh yeah like four million people, uh, but. More than that, usually the people who take charge of these things are really organizations, syndicates, uh, lobby groups. These have been crippled in Lebanon, like strategically crippled. The press syndicate in Lebanon has, is, is it, it's not it's not effective. You know, it is incapable of doing this. Uh, other other NGOs are already fighting a million a million fights within Lebanon, uh, like Smex. The people I I published the story with, they do a great job on digital security in Lebanon, but, but they're facing so many, uh, so many challenges every day that I don't, know if they, I don't know if they have the capability even to, to go say to Facebook, hey, listen, you need to sit with us at the table and like tailor conditions for us. Is it needed? Yes, but is it happening? I, I, I doubt it. I don't know. Okay, uh, we are running a little bit out of time. Maybe one last question, if it's not too long and requires a very lengthy answer. Okay, and yeah. I would also like to mention John, as all the other three panelists from before, will be on another panel at uh, 5 p.m. So yeah, uh, there are also uh, questions and further, further answers then. But Ifan, last question yeah. for you. Hi, John. Uh, Hi. Thank you one more time for the impressive uh, presentation. Um, my question is what the future for Megaphone looks like, like how do you guys uh, plan on sustaining yourself because you mentioned that um, not everyone is paid and that not everyone is necessarily a journalist. So how do you see, your, where do you see it? Um, thank you. Uh, I don't think it's a problem that not everyone is necessarily a journalist by trade. They're, you know, they're journalists now. Uh, I, I studied engineering. It's just uh, ethics plus good research skills plus uh, good communication skills. I think that's what makes a journalist. Uh, but uh, in terms of money, that's definitely something we're really thinking about because we need to be sustainable. And we've been doing this for two years and then we kind of compressed our efforts for 40 days and I speak on behalf of myself like if it, if it got to a point where it got exhausting. So yeah, we need more resources and we need to pay the resources we already have. Right now we're looking for, uh, there's a team that always looks for grants, for donors, uh, people who are willing to invest. Definitely that's always happening and uh, they do a really good job. And we're hoping, we're hoping that the role that we're doing has become even clearer now uh, and more, we've gotten the attention of people who would like to fund us. But again, that's still tricky because we want money that does not interfere with our editorial life. Like that's, that's our main, uh, that's our main view. And so many things go into that, you know, like who's giving you the money, who else are they giving money, who are they affiliated with, what do they want in return. So we're very picky. <laughs>